escaped to Britain, where he's now the BBC's chief assistant, New Music. In 1938, I was due to take my matriculation exam, my A-levels, if I may translate meaningfully. For years, I'd been scared of this event, as indeed had all other schoolboys, good or bad. In German-speaking countries, the matriculation was one of life's major traumas, and people had matriculation dreams right up to their death while books were written about the suicides which took place out of matriculation fear. Franz Werfus, Der Abituriententag, The Matriculation Day, was one outstanding novel about such a suicide. But in March of that year, a month or two before the date of the examination, the Nazis invaded Austria. The Austrian Chancellor abdicated on my 19th birthday, the 11th of March, and Hitler made his triumphant entry into Vienna on the 12th. That means one Reich, one people, one Führer. How far the Austrians welcomed the Anschluss is a difficult question. Their enthusiasm tends to be underplayed nowadays, I think. There had been a strong illegal Nazi party. There had been thousands, if not millions, of more passive sympathizers. It's not for me to guess proportions. Anyhow, the Vienna correspondent of the Völkische Beobachter went through the usual motions. The streets of Vienna are ablaze with a veritable firestorm of frenzied enthusiasm which beggars description. The crowds are beside themselves with delight. As news came of the German troops' approach, people openly embraced and hugged each other in the streets. They still can't quite believe that they've won. The German city of Vienna, and with it the whole of Austria, has arisen. Swastika flags flutter from every window and balcony. Austria is a national socialist state. Outside the official German tourist office, whose windows display a photograph of the Führer, the crowds gather. The sparkling, happy eyes of the people are the most moving thing I've ever seen. But I'm supposed to talk about myself. With the Nazi invasion, the imminent trauma of my matriculation suddenly ceased to exist. From the moment Govan was intermittently running for one's life, and the school and study aspect of it assumed, to put it mildly, a dreamlike quality. If one passed one's matriculation, one would not, as a Jew, be allowed to enter university anyway, while abroad, if one was lucky enough to get there, an Austrian or German matriculation certificate would not be recognized. Nevertheless, one did one's empty duty. After all, one had been preparing for this event for eight years, besides going to school and doing as if one cared about the matric, created the illusion, however thin, that life was going on, that one might eventually survive. For many, though, life was not going on, not at all as usual, anyhow. According to an official inquiry carried out after the war into the events of those days, the best available estimates are that the very first wave of arrests in the days of March 1938 caught more than 70,000 people. Thereafter, a regular trickle of arrests and disappearances continued. The father of a girlfriend of mine was arrested on March 13th. He had, as a barrister, conducted and won an action against the Völkische Beobachter. Well, he was arrested, taken to Dachau concentration camp, and slowly tortured to death. Friends of mine who met him there in later months were unable to recognize him. Now, in view of the large Jewish contingent in my own school, the physical separation of the form into Aryans and Jews, the former yelling Heil Hitler when the uniformed foremaster entered, who had replaced our Jewish foremaster, was not too frightening. It was easier at that adolescent stage to stand by silently and think, you fools, if there were many of you. But when we heard that our former Jewish foremaster, whom we all venerated, had been savagely beaten up and his flat plundered, the thought of you fools wasn't quite good enough. He's now a university professor in America, doing better, no doubt, than he could have done otherwise. That is the paradox but it only affected that tiny proportion of German and Austrian Jews who were not eventually gassed. 
The matriculation came and I passed without noticing, as it were. But one thing I did notice, and that was the official reaction to my German essay. For the Aryans, there were five titles for choice, four of them on such subjects as Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf and the concept of National Socialism. The fifth subject, the only one for the Jews, was an analysis of poetic realism in German literature. Well, when it came to the prize-giving stage, the German teacher, a physical cripple in SA uniform, made a speech in which he pointed to the deplorable fact that mine had been by far the best German essay. It's high time that Austrian culture is being rescued. We must have reached a low point in degeneration if it is possible for a Jew to write the only outstanding German essay. The ensuing months were spent on unsuccessful attempts to get out of the country and on being beaten up in between. My father, who was well-to-do, was dying, and it was his money which made it difficult for me to obtain a passport. Soon after the Anschluss, the following order appeared in the Austrian legal gazette. The commissioner for the four-year plan and the minister for internal affairs of the German Reich decree as follows. Para 1. Every Jew is ordered to declare his entire property, both at home and abroad, valued as of the date of this decree. Para 2. Property within the meaning of this decree means the total and entire possessions of those affected, irrespective of whether they're liable to tax or not. Para 8. Whoever fails, negligently or with malice of forethought, comply with the above instructions will be liable to a fine and or ten years penal servitude. In addition to the punishment, the court may order confiscation of the property. My father had made a full and frank declaration, and the official view was that where so much had been declared, there must be much more undeclared where that had come from. So long as the Nazis did not feel sure that they were getting hold of every penny available, I would not get my passport. I remember my father calling me into his bedroom and saying that anyway, he was glad that we had lost all our money. He had always been worried by my growing up as the son of wealthy parents and by the danger of my attributing an importance to money which he did not in reality possess. He said he didn't care two hoots about losing all his money. He didn't incidentally know that he was dying. In order to try and get a passport, one had to queue up at various places so as to obtain the necessary documents. And what usually happened was that one queued up all night without achieving any result, except that the SA or the SS came to visit these queues occasionally for the purpose of beating them up. As an official contemporary report to police headquarters had it, Sympathy for Jews or compassion with their fate was manifested only rarely and where such feelings were nevertheless expressed, however hesitantly, the majority of onlookers turned on those concerned with great energy. Any who showed excessive sympathy with the Jews were pointed out to the police. Some of these were themselves arrested. One such occasion sticks vividly in my memory because at that stage I felt as if Western civilization had abandoned us. This time I queued up in order to obtain my British visa, or rather the document confirming it, since I had no passport to put it in. Something which very few people were able to obtain, and which I was fortunate enough to have been granted because my sister was married to an Englishman who had undertaken, if necessary, to support me for the rest of my life, so that I wouldn't be a burden to the state. Now, I had to queue up outside the British consulate in order to get this document. We were a small and eminently beatable queue, and we talked with some excitement about the chances of our being beaten up while we stood there. In due course, an English consulate official came out and asked us in a stern voice to behave in an orderly fashion and not to make so much noise. 
I took the opportunity to step forward and ask him why it was necessary to stand out there in the roads when it was extremely likely that we would be beaten up sooner or later. Couldn't we wait inside, since there were so few of us? This is quite out of the question, he said, and vanished through the door, which was duly and audibly locked. Within an hour we were beaten up. There were other pleasantries, such as being arrested for short periods in order to clean some Nazi barracks. If one said that one wanted to ring home, where one had a dying father, in order to tell him that one would be late, one was told, let him die. At least I was released. Such arrests could have more serious consequences, as witness a circular by the Gestapo the secret state police of the 24th of May, 1938. To all district commissariats in Vienna, subject arrest of Jews. It has been decreed that undesirable Jews, especially those with a criminal record, are to be arrested and to be transferred to Dachau concentration camp. The arrests are to be organized by district police commissariats. Only German, that is Austrian and stateless Jews are affected. Jews of more than 50 years of age are to be arrested only in special circumstances. Some 2,000 Jews were arrested following this order and transferred to Dachau. On the 7th of November 1938, a junior official at the German embassy in Paris, Ernst vom Rath, was shot by a 17-year-old Polish Jew, Herschel Grünspan whose parents had been expelled from Germany and sent back to Poland. Vom Rath was not immediately dead, and I thought to myself that if he died, a violent pogrom was an extreme likelihood. I therefore decided to follow the news closely in order to stay at home or go into hiding when the news of his death came. The day after his death, however, I overslept. I had wanted to be at the Jewish community center where I would get one of the necessary documents for my passport at 6 a.m. in order not to be at the end of one of those enormous queues. But I woke up at 7. I hastily dressed, put the unread Völkische Beobachter into my coat pocket, ran out into the street and caught a taxi. The unread paper contained the news that from Rath had died. At the corner of the little street where the community center was, I paid off the taxi to find, to my surprise, that the street looked peaceful and abandoned. I didn't see any queues. But there was a Jew standing at the street corner, and I walked up to him and asked him whether the center was open and whether one could queue up for the documents in question. Yes, he said with a sad face, just walk over there right up to the main door. A pity that I did not, at this stage at least, have a look at my paper. I walked along to the main door, outside which stood another Jew. I walked up to him and said, It looks terribly quiet around here. Is the center really open? I want to queue up for my document. Yes, he said, with an equally sad face, just step in there. I opened the door, but instead of Jewish officials, I faced an SA man who threw me against a wall with considerable zest. When I picked myself up, I found myself in the company of a number of Jews who had just had the same experience. From Rat is dead, I asked one of them. Of course, he said. The Jewish guide outside the building had been posted by the Nazis. Whoever refused to play the game would be shot. This was the notorious November pogrom from which eventually only a small proportion of Jews escaped with their lives. The vast majority rotted away or were tortured to death in concentration camps or were ultimately exterminated, gassed. Here is a confidential report by one Lieutenant Fast of the SS who was in charge of a small detachment taking part. It is dated the 12th of November 1938 and is addressed to one of his superiors at the SS headquarters for Lower Austria. 
After my detachment had been detailed as a special duty at midnight on the 9th of November, I was ordered to report to the office of the district commissioner at 1 a.m. Also present were leaders of other SS detachments, representatives of the SA and of the police, as well as the special commissioner for the Aryanization of the Jewish property. The district commissioner gave the following briefing. In response to the cowardly Jewish assassination of third secretary von Rath in Paris, fierce popular indignation had already turned its wrath upon the Jews of Germany. Among other things, several synagogues had been set on fire. It was essential, the district commissioner continued, that in Austria too, popular indignation should rouse itself against the Jews this very night. If, as a result, any building and property belonging to the Jews should catch fire, this would be a matter for the local fire services and detachments of the National Socialist Movement were not obliged to take a hand. Within the framework of this operation, the police would have the following duties. One, looting was to be prevented, and so was the destruction or damage of Aryan property. Two, towards the end of the operation, the Jews were to be taken into custody for their own safety, especially those of working age. Popular indignation was to be given full reign until six o'clock in the morning. Until that hour, the police were to avoid all confrontation with the demonstrators. Care should be taken that all those involved in the operation should wear civilian clothing. At the time, I knew none of this, of course. After a few hours in the Jewish community center, we were taken to various primary schools which had been allocated for the purpose and set up as temporary prisons. Upon arrival, we had the first of several Gestapo interviews. The Gestapo officer had a printed form before him from which he read his questions. Among the questions I remember were the following. Since when have you been a homosexual? I'm not a homosexual, I replied. Did I ask you whether you were or did I ask you since when you had been one? When I didn't reply, he wrote in five years. How many Aryan girls have you seduced? I haven't seduced any Aryan girls, I replied. Did I ask you whether you had, or did I ask you how many you had seduced? Again, when I didn't reply, he wrote in five. After this comprehensive survey of my biography, he turned the sheet round and said, sign. I started reading it, whereupon he said, did I say read or did I say sign? I duly signed and the document was carefully filed away. Between 150 and 200 of us were then driven into a classroom which would normally have space for 20 or 30, which was to be our abode for the next six days. For three days we didn't get any food, but the fact that we didn't get any water for more than one day was worse. There were various types of beatings, and what was perhaps most interesting psychologically was that in the middle of every night appeared a special SS detachment called Verfügungstruppe, which consisted of unpaid volunteers, unpaid, that is, for this particular task, and who went through a violent beating exercise purely for the fun of it. At the other end of psychological interest was the composure and behavior of the Orthodox Jews, of whom I was not one. Quite often we were chased through the corridors with SS men with rifles on either side who beat us with those rifles while we ran through. What I did when such a corridor was in sight was to stop and wait until I had a long free space before me. Then I bent down, covered my head with my hands, and ran through the corridor as fast as I could so that I got most of the knocks on my behind. The Orthodox Jews were above any such evasive action. They slowly walked through those corridors in an upright position with the result that you couldn't identify them when they came out at the other end. But at the same time, without showing the slightest sign in their behavior of having been touched, 
telling each other the same Jewish jokes at the other end as they had before the operation started. I was stunned. There they were, people who seemed quaint, curious figures in ordinary life, now behaving in a detached manner which was far beyond the rest of us. In particular, I remember a newspaper boy whom I'd known because I always bought my papers from him. He must have been about 16 or 17. When he came out at the other end of such a corridor, I literally didn't recognize him. It took me minutes to discover who he was. But his behavior was of the orthodox kind, and when I asked him how it was possible for him to behave like that, he laughed and answered, well, we've had a few thousand years training, haven't we? What difference does one more such incident make? These people haven't reached the stage where they know what they're doing, so you can't even blame them. Then he told me a Jewish joke which was appropriate to the occasion. After three days, we got our first food paid for by the Jewish community. Most people went sick after it. I myself wasn't hungry anymore by that stage and ate very cautiously and little. On, I think, the fourth day, one chap suddenly went berserk, if berserk you can call it, and started shouting, criminals, murderers, sadists. He was shot dead, whereupon another chap likewise decided that he had had enough and jumped out of the fourth floor window. Now, this wouldn't do at all, having a Jewish corpse in the street. So we were told to stand with our faces against the wall, by way of punishment, without the slightest movement. Whoever moved would be shot dead. The SS stood with their rifles behind us. This exercise lasted about four hours, in which circumstances it was amazing to note how much you could move without moving, by gradually shifting your weight from one leg to the other. As for events in the outside world, here's a statistical survey. In Vienna, 17 synagogues and 61 prayer houses, described by the Nazi newspaper Der Stürmer as not real houses of God, but dens of iniquity, were set on fire. 7,800 Jews arrested, including 1,226 who already had permission to emigrate, or who were listed as wishing to emigrate, at the Center for Jewish Emigration. 4,083 Jewish shops were plundered and closed down. 1,950 dwellings ransacked. In Germany as a whole, damage is to 25 million marks and 7,500 shops and stores were destroyed. These figures were revealed at a meeting of representatives of the ministries of finance and economic affairs. Hermann Goering, who presided in his capacity as commissioner for the four-year plan, exclaimed, Good heavens, why couldn't you have killed off a couple of hundred Jews instead of destroying so much valuable property? In fact, 91 Jews were killed during the pogrom, according to the official German statistics. The number of those who committed suicide has never been established. Goering later made a speech in which he promised that within a year, Vienna would be Judenrein, free of Jews and clean. That kind of promise the Nazis tended to keep. Now, to give a full description of the events of those days of imprisonment would be repetitive and boring. Suffice it to say that more often than not, when something frightening was in store for us, we were told of it beforehand so that we could fully savor our anxiety for hours before the event. As a result, when on the sixth day we were told, tomorrow at 6 a.m. you will be castrated and at 8 o'clock you will be executed, we believed it. By that time, mind you, most of us were beyond the will to survive, almost too tired to be capable of fear. Nevertheless, at one moment during that night, the thought flicked through my mind. If by any remote chance I should succeed in getting out of here and in dying in a bed, 
I swear to myself that I'll never again be in a bad mood, whatever the circumstances of my life and my death. I'll come back to this one later. We were not castrated at six o'clock nor executed at eight. Instead, we were transported to a proper police prison where we met proper ordinary criminals, veritable saints compared to our guards and officers. In the course of the morning, after a series of the usual violent incidents, there was another Gestapo interview. This time, the atmosphere seemed slightly more courteous. Sit down, the officer said as I approached his desk. I could not believe my ears and was right not to. As I sat down, the chair was, of course, pulled from under me. Nevertheless, the questions seemed slightly less Kafkaesque than the previous interviews, and I decided to be on my guard just in case there was some point in giving a skillful answer. Why are you bleeding all over? Oh, well, I fell down a whole flight of stairs as I came up here, I said. Fell? You fell down a flight of stairs? Yes, I stumbled and fell. Did anybody beat you? No. Did you see anybody beat anybody? No. Nothing at all? No. He adopted a more solemn voice. Have you any complaints about the treatment you received? None whatever. While I answered, I heard an excerpt from an interview at the next desk. Do you know why you are in here? I believe because I am one of the murderers of Pomrat. That is correct. My own interrogator now proceeded to a series of questions which could not but raise hopes in my mind. If we released you, how soon would you be able to leave the country? Immediately and I would leave tomorrow. That of course was a lie. For more than eight months, I had tried in vain to obtain a passport. Have you any proof that you can leave immediately? It so happens I have, I said. I have a British visa and I have the relevant document on me. I pulled the British consulate's confirmation out of my pocket. He read it carefully, then shouted, Form B! In due course, four identical forms were placed in front of me, which this time I was required to read. They said that in no circumstances for the rest of my life, wherever I was, would I say a word about what I'd seen and experienced while being in prison, and that I was aware that if at any stage I were to disclose what I had seen and experienced, I would meet with just punishment wherever I was. In perjuring myself joyfully. Unless this was another funny game, there really was. The officer then shouted D, which made my heart sink again because I thought it might mean Dacha. I was pushed into group D then, and the excitement about the possible release had totally overcome my exhaustion. Where a day or two before, I'd wholly given up, accepting the end without much difficulty. The desire to survive had come back explosively. Group D was pushed into one of those corridors we knew so well, again with SS lined up on either side, complete with rifles. But though we were chased through the corridors, nobody touched us this time, which of course reinforced hope. This operation continued for a considerable time. We were chased through a vast variety of corridors, up and down staircases, almost always with SS lined up on either side, and always being left unharmed. We were, however, reaching exhaustion point and wondered how long we would be able to continue. I happened to be the first in my particular group, the front runner, as it were, and running along a corridor, I came to face a glass door without being able to stop before it. I crashed into it, and as I picked myself up and got through the door, I was standing in the street. 
This I realized was my discharge from prison. There's an extract, not readily comprehensible to me, from the minutes of the Regional Economic Committee for Vienna, drafted by an SS captain by the name of Seliger, and interesting, I should think, as a psychological document rather than as a factual report on what he calls the population at large. As for popular reaction to the events of the 10th of November and the following days, the unanimous view was that it had been one of revulsion and horror, and that in the execution of the operation, scandalous scenes had been enacted which did great damage to the prestige of the party and the government. Two of those present declared that if another party existed in Germany, it would be the duty of every right-thinking man and woman to support it. All those present declared unanimously that pogroms and vandalism were not suitable means for solving the Jewish question, and that the destruction, looting, and devastation which had taken place had filled not only the population at large, but even large sections of the party with disgust and shame. Well, I don't want to say anything against this particular man, but neither I nor any of my fellow Jews were in touch with any of this revulsion and horror, disgust and shame. Anyway, the first thing I wanted to do as I was out in the street was to ring my father to tell him that I was all right. As I tried to do this, I noticed the effect of what one might call a traumatic neurosis. Across the road, I saw a telephone box, but in order to reach it, I would have had to pass an SS man who was posted outside the prison. I tried to get myself to pass him, explaining to myself that at this stage he would not possibly harm me, since I was obviously a released person and as care had always been taken not to show the outside world what was happening to prisoners. In spite of several mental attempts, however, I could not bring myself to pass him. Instead, I walked right round the block in order to reach the telephone box from the other side without the necessity of having to pass an SS man. Now, the Gestapo were not as well organized as they were reputed to be, and I should not, in fact, have been released. From another Gestapo headquarters, a warrant for my arrest had been issued before I had been freed. I came to know about this fact through bribing an SS officer to look up my files. He had been an acquaintance of a half-Jewish cousin of mine, through whom I advanced payment to him. The information was that I was to be arrested because my father had money in Hungary and England, which had not been declared. Neither fact true, incidentally, but that did not, of course, make any difference, and there was no point in trying to establish the truth. One consequence which seemed to flow from this state of affairs had been that I had been told before my arrest that the large sum of English money I forget the actual amount, I think it was about a thousand pounds, was needed in addition to the official escape tax, which comprised all my father's available money, in order for me to obtain one of the documents needed to get my passport. My brother-in-law had duly paid the money, but I never got the documents. As a matter of fact, the Jews themselves were made to pay compensation to the German government for the damage, the devastation, at the meeting of finance and economic ministries, presided over by Goering, which I've already mentioned, the following was decreed. One, German Jews must make restitution for all damage and reimburse insurance companies for any payments they'd been obliged to make. Two, as an atonement for the death of Councillor von Rath, a fine is to be levied on all Jews totaling 1,000 million marks. Three, all Jewish enterprises, shops and factories to be taken over compulsorily by non-Jews. The sale price to be paid into blocked accounts. Fortunately, my father was able to scrape together enough money to pay this restitution and atonement tax too. Well, in full possession of the information in my file after my release, 
I was, of course, determined to be extremely cautious in order not to be caught again. I rarely slept at home and generally kept myself as unfine as possible. At the same time, I had to continue to try to get the necessary documents for obtaining my passport and indeed the passport itself. Each such attempt was, of course, fraught with danger, since, in theory, I should have been arrested each time I appeared at one of the relevant police or immigration departments. Fortunately, inefficiency prevailed. I remember one particular instance when the official in question looked at my name, repeating, Keller, Keller, I know your name. I ought to know your face. I remained silent. He had no doubt been given or shown a copy of the warrant, but had forgotten his instructions. Ah, he suddenly said, I seem to remember. You probably were one of the Jews down we employed to sift the documents, and that's where I know your name and your face from. I joyfully agreed, though of course I'd never been in the place. In the end, I did actually obtain all the necessary documents and my passport. But by this stage, I and my uncle advisor, a barrister, were doubtful about how to manage my departure. For the border police, as well as officials at Vienna Airport, would be in possession of the warrant for my arrest. That much we knew from the information which we got from the file about me. However, another event occurred which caused the absolute need for my immediate escape, or immediate attempt to escape anyway. My father died and I became his sole heir. It was obvious that as soon as the fact of his death was known, there would be redoubled attempts to arrest me and not to let me go. My uncle and I finally decided for me to try a flight from Vienna rather than a train journey. For one thing, immigration by aeroplane was rare at that time, and one might possibly hope that I would be expected at a border rather than at the airport. For another, my uncle, if he accompanied me to the airport, would know if the escape succeeded and would be able to notify my mother and sister in London. I bought myself an air ticket for the next plane and next morning proceeded to Vienna airport with my uncle. As we waited in the airport lounge, we sat back to back because we thought that two Jews being seen together at the same time might arouse suspicion. We were talking over our shoulders when I suddenly heard a stern voice ask my uncle, what are you doing here? I'm waiting for a friend who's arriving on the plane from Prague. What's his name? Uncle invented the name. There was a short silence and then the voice said, come with us. As I was passing through the passport control, or trying to anyway, the officer, looking at my name and picture, said, Keller, Keller, Keller. I know that name and I know that picture. There's something wrong with you. I shrugged my shoulders in bafflement, hoping to God that he'd forgotten his instructions, as his predecessor had at that immigration office and that he would be equally disinclined to tell his superiors that he had forgotten. Ah, he said after a short pause, I think I remember. You didn't surrender your driving license when all Jews were ordered to. I had never driven a car and I had had no driving license, but I immediately confessed. Yes, this is quite true, I said, but I have apologized and did finally surrender it. I simply had he shook his head musingly and finally said come with me I was taken into an empty room where I was told to undress and every inch of my clothing was carefully examined as of course was my luggage the whole operation took a very long time and the departure time of my plane had passed but through a window, I still saw the plane standing on the runway. Eventually, the investigation having yielded a negative result, the officer who had taken me into the room said, all right, then dress and get into that plane. As the plane took off, 
There was the overwhelming consciousness of survival, but at the same time, extreme anxiety about my uncle's fate. He was going to ring my mother and sister upon my departure, so I thought that if they were at the airport in Croydon, that he had been released. And if they weren't, that he hadn't been. Unfortunately, when I arrived in Croydon, there was no trace of them. I was now certain that my uncle was on his concentration camp. Eventually, however, I did find my family. They had gone to the wrong door. My uncle had been released after an hour's interrogation and had telephoned them. I was fortunate. Thousands of other Jews, eventually millions, six million Jews weren't. They didn't die in the war as part of the cruelty of war. They didn't die in battle. They were exterminated, the vastest extermination of human beings in the history of the world. Against this background, let's hear from Dr. Josef Goebbels, Germany's Minister of Propaganda, and a man with literary cultural aspirations, had to say in an official statement in that self-same month of November 1938. The cowardly assassination by the Jew Grunspan has provoked in the entire German people a most understandable indignation, which in view of the unexampled turpitude of the deed and the unbelievable impudence with which it was carried, manifests itself in anti-Jewish demonstrations. If, despite the most justified fury of all Germans, not a hair on the head of a single Jew was so much as touched. The world should give due recognition to the German people's sense of discipline and decency. Two conclusions emerge. One of them what I learned to regard as sour grapes. For a long time I thought that if one happened to survive it all, it was important to have had this experience because otherwise one would not really be aware of what human beings were capable of. That's to say, if my best friend had told me about the things I had witnessed, about this indiscriminate, enthusiastic collective sadism, I shouldn't have believed him. The trouble is that psychologically, this realization of what human beings are capable of at the most level simply does not work in the long run. Today, although I know purely intellectually what I experienced, the emotional awareness of it has been repressed. Or to put it differently, I'm just as incapable of appreciating this level of reality emotionally as I would have been had I never experienced it. This type of repression is probably the most dangerous obstacle along the road towards an ethical improvement of society. It's all very well to be intellectually aware of what people are capable of, but if you don't feel it in your bones, you are likely not to do enough about preventing recurrences of such sadistic climaxes. But the other conclusion, equally psychological, has remained reality. I've mentioned the thoughts which flashed through my mind at the very stage when, rationally, I'd given up all hope that if against all realistic expectations I was going to survive, I would never again be in a bad mood. This one surprisingly still works. Whenever there is motivation for a bad mood, it's enough for me to remind myself of this thought and the attendant emotion comes back with it, the result being a grateful elation about being alive. Hans Keller telling the story of the time of his life. The extracts from contemporary documents were read by Ronald Fletcher. The program was first broadcast in February of this year, and the producer was Walter Wallach.